morning, Cross Point, whether you're online joining us or whether you're here, I just want to invite you to stand to your feet. Let's worship together this morning. have a seat. Uh, my name is Riley Lester, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And uh, this past week, my wife had the opportunity to take a, a few days off and go to the beach, but um, we got towards the end of our trip, and we were so excited to come home. And one of the main reasons, because we wanted to get back to church. You know, we just, one thing is we love our church. Not about you, but there's something about gathering together. And here at Cross Point, we gather together for the mission of pointing people to Jesus and inspiring them to live the cross-shaped life. 
And we do that when we worship together. We do that through a discipleship in our groups ministry, on campus groups, off campus groups. We do that through serving in various areas of the church and the parking team and the greeters at the door, our small group leaders, our next gen ministries. We also do that through sending as we sent people to San Diego a few weeks ago and we have more trips we're working on developing and sending you across the streets of your neighborhoods to your neighbors. I heard someone walking in this morning saying, hey, this is their first time here. We invited them and they came. It's their living sense, inviting their neighbors to come. And it's so exciting to see that week in and week out. So if you're here in the room, welcome. If you're watching online, welcome. Thank you for joining us. If you're visiting with us, if you could go to this link right here. If you go to crosspointchurch.com slash guest and just fill the information there, we just wanna know that you're visiting with us. We'd love to send you something. Uh, we won't stalk you, but we'll reach out and just say, hey, thank you for joining us um, because we want you to know that here you are welcomed. Whether that, again, that's online or here in the room, here is a family of believers that genuinely loves one another that loves the Lord and wants to glorify him in all that we do. So if you would, if you would just simply stand up, give us someone a high five, a fist bump, wave across the aisle, tell them good morning, and why don't you tell them how much you love your church and why you love your church.
sing that chorus one more time? Our deliverer, you are Savior. In your presence we find our strength. Over everything, our redemption, God, with us. You are God, with us. Salvation. 
can stand against nothing can even come against the Lord you are high and lifted up we put you in your place today you are on the throne we honor you we worship you we thank you for your presence in Jesus name amen, amen. you guys can grab a seat can we just thank God for, for Jesus, amen. Wow, nothing is more important than giving honor to God. Nothing is more important than giving honor to God. I love uh, one of the songs we sang this morning talks about the God's word is alive and, it, and it's living and it's breathing. And it's that kind of Savior that we serve. It's that kind of God that we love. It's that kind of God that's our Savior. And uh, this morning, we have the opportunity to give him tribute by giving to him, which is just a part of our journey. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, if you sow sparingly, so will you reap sparingly. But if you sow generously, you will reap generously. And I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I want to be on the generous side of reaping and not the sparing side of reaping, but that's just me.
but I hope that that's true for you as a believer. But you know, when you give to God through, through the church, through Crosspoint, you're giving to more than just turning the lights on and running the AC, which we seem to do a good job of that. Um, I hear people say, it's cold in here. And we do that so you won't go to sleep during Mike's sermons. That's, that's essential. And by the way, speaking of Mike, Mike, I want to just say publicly to you, thank you for sharing from your heart this, this July and the book of Joshua and the message that you are serving and giving. Um, he, he's, you know, every day he realizes how much time uh, our pastor invests in, uh, in his message preparation. And, uh, and it's, it's a labor of love. And so would you just join me in thanking him for, for his gift of that? He's, he's got his parents here today from North Carolina, and of course his family is here as they always are, and his mom and dad watch him faithfully online. They get to be here in person today, so that's a great gift, and we're, we're glad to have them here. But you know, as we give to God, we, we give to change lives. That's what we're giving to. We're giving to the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the church. And we've given you several ways to give today. You can go to our website, crosspointchurch.com giving. You can text give to 678-582. 8180. You can go to the app, crosspointchurch.com slash app. And then if you're here in the room and you want to give in person, you can find one of the giving centers in the back of the room or in the lobby. And we are thankful for you. We're thankful for your faithfulness. We're thankful for those of you that watch us online and those that give faithfully. And it is a privilege to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We're thankful for the privilege to give to you. You are a faithful God. Jesus, we are thankful for the sacrifice that you've made for us to know you as Savior, for us to know what salvation is. And God, convict our hearts where we have sin in our lives because with with sin in our hearts, we can't be fully devoted to Jesus Christ. So show us that sin. Put a light on it so that we can confess it to you and give it back to you and let it go and live a holy and set-apart lifestyle. God, thank you for the faithfulness of our people who give week in and week out generously through their tithes and through their offerings. And Father, we're grateful for the word that you have for us today from your word. We're grateful for the faithfulness of your uh, direction, your love, your wisdom in our lives. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning to each one of you. I want to welcome you who are in the room. I want to welcome those of you who are online. Thank you for being with us. You know what? I thought about this, and Bruce stole a little bit of my thunder. Bruce, thank you for the kind words. Uh, Let's just continue the love fest a little bit this morning. Riley started off by saying, I drove all the way home from vacation because I love my church. Bruce uh, said some real nice things about me. Bruce is trying to deflect praise a little bit. Do you realize tomorrow Bruce has a large birthday? (laughs) That's right. Everybody give it up for Bruce Hardy. Thank you for those kind words, Bruce. But I will say this. uh, Bruce has uh, been a friend to me, but he is also a man worthy to be followed. I told his boys uh, just a few moments ago, Ben and Rob, privately, and I'll say it publicly, because I think it's uh, you are to give honor where honor is due. And I told both of those boys that I was really proud of both Ben and Rob because they've grown up into godly young men. Not only that, but they married two godly young women that are back here, and they brought their kids to church this morning. As they are here, we're grateful for you guys modeling the way for your families. 
And I've said to those boys, even this morning, I said, I hope my kids turn out just like those two boys have. And you know what? That's what the church is all about. It's about understanding what the family of God does when you gather together and you make God a priority. So may that be the way we start this morning and uh, we open our Bibles. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and begin turning to Joshua chapter 7. I think a lot about family. I, I genuinely do. Bruce and I have conversations. Uh, Doc and I have conversations. All these young guys, we have conversations of what does it look like for us to simply honor the Lord with our families. And uh, so I think about family a lot, and uh, I have had multiple opportunities just to reflect on what God has done in my life. And in December of 2002, uh, I want to tell you just a little bit of a snapshot of my life. December 2002, life was sailing right along. I was married. I was financially strong. I had just finished seminary a, a year or two before. I had two great kids. My marriage and my ministry was flourishing. I had just resigned my church, and I was beginning the process of packing and moving and going to another opportunity, another church. It was another big adventure that God was taking me and my family. was, And, and life was moving fast, and everything was going great. And then January 3rd, just a very short time from that time, 2003, on the day the moving trucks were literally pulling out of our driveway, my wife's mom was diagnosed with bladder cancer. All the dreams and the excitement about the future took a backseat to the cancer that was in my mother-in-law's body. My wife, many of you know, she is a nurse. She went to take care of her mom. And six months to the day, my mother-in-law was gone. What I didn't understand then, but I understand now, is that cancer is a nasty disease. Some of you in this room and watching online, you know that all too well. You have had someone, a loved one, a close friend that has had it, or perhaps even uh, walk through the valley of the shadow of death with that disease. Maybe some of you in this room have had cancer. And once the, the cells of cancer begin to spread, it is very hard to kill. It invades every area of your body. It resists treatment. It affects vital organs. It started with my mother-in-law in the bladder, and it moved probably to the sp spine. And unless you slow it down or get rid of it completely, it can lead to death. Isn't it true that life's biggest moments... Life's biggest moments are often followed by some of the hardest times imaginable. New city, new family, a two and a half year old, and my son was two and a half months old, a new job, excitement, cancer. We've been studying the life of Joshua. Joshua was the unquestioned leader of God's people, the Israelites. It just experienced the high like few had ever experienced before. Joshua and the Israelites were riding a wave of euphoria that was physical in nature and spiritual and emotional and mental. In fact, we studied this verse last week. It says this, Joshua 6, 27 says, The Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all of the land. Remember, Joshua was leading his people, the people of God, home to the promised land that was promised to him years, decades before, a land that was flowing with milk and honey, and they had seen the hand of the Lord part a sea. The fortified city of Jericho, as we learned last week, was given into their hands by the sovereign hand of God's power. All they did was shout, and remember last week we talked about they just blew some trumpets. And the only response that God called from the people was absolute loyalty and obedience. This was God's war to be played by God's rules. And to everyone's knowledge, Israel had done just that. They had done everything that God had said, and all was right with the world. But our story goes from this tremendous high to a devastating low in one verse. 
And that's what I love about the Bible is the Bible was written in its original text without chapters, without verses. It was just one long story of the grand narrative of God's working in, throughout history. But in one verse, we see in Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, we see this shock that takes place. If you have your Bibles, I hope that you will follow along with me. It's the sixth book of the Bible. And chapter 7, verse 1 begins with the word, but... An ominous note, let's read it together. Joshua chapter 1, or chapter 7, verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your dear people that have chosen to be in this room and online hearing from your word. Father, I pray that you would help me to get out of the way, that you would speak this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's drive, dive right into the story this morning. Last week, we learned that the city of Jericho was destroyed, and God had strict instructions of how that may go about. He gave him instructions about how to march, when to shout, and what to do after the victory. All the medals that they found, anything they found that was a precious metal, was to go into the very treasury of the Lord. In fact, the gold and the silver and the bronze and the iron we see in chapter 6, verse 18, all these things were to be kept for the Lord. And everything else was to be destroyed. Do not take anything was the command of the Lord. When you go in and fight and take this battle, I will give you the people into your hand. We're going to shout. We're going to play the trumpets. And when we go through, we will take that city. And you will not take anything out of that city. Everything that I have commanded you to do, you will take and put it in the treasury. Everything else is to be burned. The city of Jericho was taken. The Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout all the land. And all is good. The next step comes, and what happens when one conquering army takes another conquering army? As soon as you pass through Jericho, what do you do? You go to the next city. The next city was a small hilltop village of Ai. It's spelled Ai, but pronounced Ai. What should have been an easy battle was a loss for the Israelites. You see, it became the only battle that was lost on the way to the promised land. 36 men died for the Israelites on that day. The enemy chased the Israelites down that hillside. It was an embarrassment. The enemy was emboldened, saying, hey, if we can do this to them, surely we'll do it again if they come back. The name of the Lord was tarnished. Why? Because when you look at this, when God is on your team, no one is supposed to die. When God is on your team, you're supposed to win at all costs. In fact, the people thought that the name of the Lord was tarnished, but indeed we know that that will never be the case. Joshua falls on his face. The story says if he falls on his face and asks God like you and I many times will do when something happens that we don't understand or something that is out of our control. Why, God? Why did you allow this cancer into my life? Why did you allow all these things to happen to me? But in this case, it wasn't about health. It was about why did you allow the enemy to beat us and defeat us and run us out of there. And the perfect illustration is this. Joshua 7, 7 verse 10 says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Can you imagine the voice of God? Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and they've lied and put them amongst their own belongings. Now, let's leave that up for just a moment. He says, get up, Joshua. I don't know why you're burying your, your face in the dirt. When it comes to sin this morning, it is important for us to know that God is all business. He wastes no time getting to the issue. He says, hey, listen, Israel, the people of Israel have broken faith. We read that in chapter 7, verse 1. In regard to the devoted things, those things that God had said are strictly mine. Now, they acted unfaithfully. This term right here that's on the screen, they transgressed. This, this term is a transgression. It's the same term as adultery. They were cheaters. 
They betrayed the trust of the Lord. Six unique charges, six unique verbs shows the totality of their sins. It was a mess. Let's look at them again. They sinned. They transgressed. Now, these little, these little semicolons here, little English lesson, the semicolons were also. It was kind of the idea that it was building. You sinned, and also they transgressed, and also they took, and also they stole, also they lied, also they put them. It's kind of like some of you, when you go on that picnic, you eat a hamburger, and also a hot dog, and and also some chips, and also some ice cream. It's, it's this idea of compounding upon itself. While the passage states that Israel sinned, in reality, folks, this morning, it was only one man. It was only one man that sinned, but Israel is getting the blame. They have done these things. Through one man Sin entered the camp of God's people. And his name was Achan. We're going to learn about Achan. But through one man, sin entered the camp of God's people. And through one man, the entire family of Israel was affected, was defiled. You see, when one man sins, all are affected. It's just like my mother-in-law's cancer. You see, sin is cancer to the believer, to the unbeliever. It ravages the body. While her, sin, her, her cancer, excuse me, her cancer started in the bladder, it went into her spine and ended up affecting every system, organ of the body. It's a sobering thought. And it's a sobering thought I want you to get this morning is this. Sin doesn't just destroy a relationship with God, but will devastate men and women, entire families, and affect future generations to come. I want you to notice a couple things this morning. The first thing is this. I want you to notice the pattern of sin. I want you to notice the pattern of sin. As we read forward, the pattern of sin is the same today as it was yesterday and decades ago and centuries ago. The depravity of man is seen in Achan's words. Look in verse 19. It says this. Then Joshua said to Achan, Tell me now, what have you done? Do not hide from me, hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned. So Achan is now saying, I'm confessing. You, you found me out, I'm confessing. Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. He, he gives specifics. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak, uh, an idea of a royal robe from the city of Jericho. A beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I coveted them. I saw them. Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Now, when you look at this, you see a pattern of sin that is common to all of this. All of us, and it is this. It is I saw, I coveted, I took, and I hid. That coveted is the word of you cheated on the covenant of God. And that is exactly what you and I do today. We see something we want, we desire it, we then take it, and then we try to hide it. Have you ever heard that pattern somewhere before? How about the Garden of Eden? Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 says this. So when the woman, that's Eve... When the woman, Eve, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, what did she do? She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking, a God walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Here's what I love about the Bible, is if you just take one verse, listen, we went from verse 27 of chapter 6 to chapter 7, verse 1. One verse, we then point us right back to Genesis. The Bible is to be eaten and consumed together. They saw, they desired, they coveted, they took, they hid themselves. The pattern of sin is universal to us all. One man, Achan, defiled the entire people of God there in that camp. One man, one couple, Adam and Eve, defiled all of humanity in the garden. Have you ever seen one of those Crayola, I don't know what you call them, color tablets, I guess, that you put in the bathtub with your kids? 
It's one little tiny tablet releases color that affects the entire bathtub of water. Look at this. You throw one little tablet in, and what happens? It just spreads over time and turns the whole bathtub a certain color. And that's exactly what sin does. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam and Eve, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Now, listen. You may say, why in the world did I come to church today? Riley was excited to come back from vacation for this. Where is the, where is the good news? We see this common uh, sin, common sin pattern that we, we see that is in everything. We see, we covet, we take, we hide. But that's, that's not even the worst news. The rebuke of sin. I want you to see number two, the rebuke of sin. Let's go back to verse 22. Look at what takes place here. Oftentimes we, we think we get away with sin or, or we try to get away with sin. And look what Joshua does. Verse 22. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to his tent. Remember, he confesses, Achan confesses. They run to his tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent, took all the possessions that he had stolen out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they, the entire community, and they laid them down before the Lord. This word laid them down literally is the idea of oil being poured out. That every crevice was laid out before the Lord. There's all of our sin, all of the sin of these items that were taken were laid before the Lord. What is it sometimes that you and I try to get away with? When was the last time you said, hey God, I want to give you these things that are rightfully yours. Whether it's dreams or ambitions, whether it's a paycheck or whether it's your kids or whether it's your future. A lot of times we like to hold on to that. We don't want to lay them before the Lord and say, you do whatever it is that you will have in my life. You see, whatever we hold on to, whatever that we are hiding and trying to hide from God in our covetous nature is always going to be exposed. There is no hiding from God. Numbers tells us this about God. You're, be sure your sin will find you out. And that is not an encouraging thing this morning. Except unless you're a father and you see your child trying to get away with something, you want that child to be exposed. Why? So they can learn, so they can understand the grace of the father. The psalmist in Psalm 139, 12 writes this, Even the darkness is not dark to you, God. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. You see, sometimes we can hide things and pull things over on our families or on co-workers, on this and that, but we will never sin without God taking notice because everything is laid bare before the Lord. Your sin, whether it's private or public, is not secret. Your sin, whether known or unknown, does not escape the notice of God. Your sin, whether big or small, small defiles the entire body. Sin is a cancer that spreads. And that's the bad news this morning. The bad news that all of us sin. Romans 3.23 says, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. Sin defiles all. That's even worse news. Sin is seen by God and seen by all. And then what we just said is all sin will rebu be rebuked by a holy God. Welcome to church. But I want you to notice number three. I want you to notice the penalty of, the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is the Bible teaches us that we will pay a penalty for this sin. Bad news is we all sin. The worst news is that there is a penalty for sin. And unfortunately, the payment is really, really high. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. Look what Joshua does in 24. 24, and Joshua and all Israel took him, all Israel with him, took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak, the garment, and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor, Hold that up there just for a moment. The Valley of Achor means disaster, but this passage, if you go through there, it says, hey, listen, he has silver and a cloak and it's gold and his sons and daughters and oxen and donkeys and sheep, and he had his house, his tent. 
Achor means valley of trouble. They brought them up to the valley of trouble. Next verse, let's go to 25. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble? See, Achor, the valley of trouble. Why did you bring trouble on us? And the Lord brings trouble on you today, Joshua says. And all Israel stoned him with stones. And they burned him with fire and stoned them with stones. This is not an easy passage, passage, ladies and gentlemen. It is a terrible, terrible scene. Why do we see this taking place? Because it is good to know this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that God will not allow sin to go unpunished. Sad inclusion on this passage was that his sons and his daughters were included. This penalty of this sin cost Achan his name and his future generations. You see, he got all of his generations and they were, they were wiped from this earth. Why? His name didn't get carried on because of his sin. Sin this morning must be completely and utterly wiped from the camp. My camp and your camp. In God's eyes, no sin will be tolerated. We must eradicate it from our lives just like they were to eradicate it from the nation of Israel. In fact, David Platt, I was listening to a sermon of his and he, he pointed out two things and I thought it was interesting. David Platt makes this statement. He says, sin affects the physical body. And the physical, in the meaning, the generations that come, the sons and the daughters and the children and the next generations. But he also makes a statement, and you see it in this passage, that sin affects the spiritual body as well, the church. I just wonder this morning if there's men and women in here that your families may be experiencing some of this just because there's sin in the camp. And I simply want to say to you that I don't want in any way to see any of my sin ever affect the body of Christ, his church. The penalty of sin is too great not to get rid of it, all of it. If you find cancer in your body and the doctor says, hey, I got some of it, you're not going to be satisfied with that. You want him to get all of it. You want it all gone. This morning, I, I brag on our pastor because I love him. I think the world of him. And he is a man worthy to be followed. And I want to tell you something that he does privately down here on the front row before he comes up to preach. Almost every Sunday that I sit beside him right before he steps up to preach, he whispers these words to me. He says, Mike, to the best of my knowledge... And to the extent of my conviction from the Lord, there is no unconfessed sin in my life. Why does he militantly and confess and repent of his sin and say, Mike, I want you to know, to the best of my ability, I am walking into that pulpit with no unconfessed sin in my life. Is he still a sinner? Yes, we all are. But he is giving it to the Lord. Why does he do that? One, to hold himself accountable. Two, that his family would not be affected. And three, his preaching and the power in the pulpit and his church, this church, would not be affected by anything in his life. After all, one man defiled a nation. One man defiled all of humanity in the Garden of Eden. And let us be clear this morning, God hates sin. God hates sin. Pattern of sin is common to all. The rebuke of sin affects all. The penalty of sin will be paid by all. But there is good news this morning. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord when the good news comes. We don't have to stay in that sin of destruction. I want you to notice number four. The peace of canceled sin. The peace comes when your sin is canceled. Verse 26, let's go there quickly. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. We've talked about memorial stones the last couple of weeks. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Trouble or Achor. What's a side note to this whole story, and I want to encourage you to do it tonight before you go to bed. Read chapter 8. Read chapter 8 because what takes in place of chapter 8 is you realize Achan needed nothing. And we just saw that he had all these animals and he had a tent. He had a place to lay his head. He had, he had things. 
He didn't need anything. He had possessions. If he would have just waited on God, one more chapter, what takes place is Joshua takes a whole army and says, AI is in my sights now. Takes a whole army and he just obliterates all of it. He destroys all of it and he says, hey, plunder. The plunder of the city, hey, boys, y'all can have whatever you want. God has not deemed any of his just specially for him. Had he, had he just waited one more little bit for God, but isn't that what we do? We see, we covet, we take, and we hide. The reward of canceled sin is a restored relationship with the Father. It is a soulful peace. The Lord hates sin, yet we all deserve the fate of Achan. Through one man's sin spread to all of mankind. Listen closely, church. But God, through one man, paid the penalty of our sin. Through one man, the world was defiled. And through one man, your sin and my sin, for those who have faith in him, is canceled. There are four verses I want to read to you real quickly. And I pray that this is one of those moments where you just say, glory be to God, this is a great day to be reminded of those things. Let's start with Romans chapter 5, verse 19. We'll go quick. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. It's Jesus. Next, next verse. He himself bore our sins in his body, that's Jesus on the tree, that's the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, by his stripes, we have been healed. Next verse. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. The last verse is this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Glory be to God, church. Is there any sin in your camp this morning? Is there anything in your life that you have seen, you have coveted, you have taken that was not rightfully yours? If you will, just for a moment, I'm going to ask everybody in the room to pick up this. It was in your seat that you had this morning. For those of you who are watching online, we're going to drop this into the chat for you. For just a moment, I want to lead us into a prayer of confession. And for those of you who are here, uh, would you just make it your prayer this morning? It's from uh, the Valley of Vision, a book of prayers from Puritans a long time ago, but I believe that it is relevant for today. It ministers to my soul, and hopefully it will minister to yours today. Would you just read along with me? I'm just going to go slow. It says this, make this a prayer of your, your heart today. Merciful Lord, Pardon all my sins of this day, week, year. All the sins of my life, sins of early and middle and advanced years of omission and commission, of morose, peevish, and angry, angry tempers, of lip, life, and walk, of hard-heartedness, unbelief, presumption, and pride, of unfaithfulness to the souls of men, of want of bold decision in the cause of Christ of deficiency in outspoken zeal for his name, of bringing dishonor upon thy great name, of deception, injustice, untruthfulness in the dealings with others, of impurity in thought, word, and deed, of covetousness, which is idolatry, of substance unduly hoarded, improvidentially squandered, not consecrated to the glory of thee, the great giver. Sins in private and in the family, in study and recreation, in the busy haunts of men. God, forgive me in the study of thy word and in the neglect of it. Forgive me a prayer irreverently offered and coldly withheld. 
in time misspent, in yielding to Satan's wiles, in opening my heart to his temptations, in being unwatchful when I know him nigh, in quenching the Holy Spirit, sins against light and knowledge against conscience and the restraints of thy spirit against the law of eternal love, pardon all my sins, known and unknown, felt and unfelt, confessed and not confessed, remembered or forgotten, good Lord, hear and hearing, forgive. One man, one sin, all of humanity stained, all guilty, all will pay the price. However, one man came to eradicate sin. The only man that could, his name is Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He died a sinless death to pay for the sins of mankind. In fact, I just read this just a moment ago, 1 Peter 2.24. He, Jesus himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to this sin and live forevermore to righteousness. By his wounds, because he gave his life, you have the opportunity today to be healed. Romans 10, 9, we say it all the time. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him, Jesus, from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 13 says it even simpler. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from what? Your sins. This morning, would you pray with me all across this room, online? There's a decision to be made, ladies and gentlemen, because this is a tough passage. But make it clear today that we all sin. We all are burdened with sin from Adam and Eve that has been carried on until now. And there is a penalty to be paid. And Jesus paid a price that you and I could not pay in order that we might have hope for eternity. Right now, if you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sins, I want to invite you to do that. Simply pray us prayer just like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that we will one day be held accountable for those sins. Father, I ask that you would come into my life and forgive me of my sins and change me now even now, God. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and change me forever and give me hope for eternity. To the best of my ability, God, I will follow you for the rest of my days. For a believer in this room, perhaps you have been struggling with a secret sin that nobody knows about except you and the Lord. Would you right now just simply confess that to the Lord? Would you simply say, God, I don't want to be a hindrance to my family. I don't want to be a hindrance to my future or to my church. And may we be known as a church of believers who are sinful in nature, but we confess sin in our midst. Lord Jesus, even now, you do business with us so that we may see your hand in, this, in, in our midst and on this corner. God, that we would be seen in such that that church runs hard after God. God, would you change lives even now? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, listen, there's, a, there's an encouraging thing. Today's been a kind of a tough message, heavy. But here's the thing. If you prayed that prayer, let me give light, uh, let me give uh, gravity to the moment. And that is that Jesus saved you. If you are online and you prayed with me and said, Jesus, come to my life, he has done that. And we want to make you aware that we want to follow up and we want to walk with you on this journey. If you would, if you made a decision this morning, I want to invite you to go to crosspointchurch.com slash decision or text Jesus to 678-255-26 or 2566. And I simply want you to just 
let us know of your decision. Perhaps in the room, you go outside to our connection point and just say, hey, listen, I prayed with Mike today. And they're going to ask you a couple questions. You're going to be good. They're going to help you. At the end of the day, we want to see lives changed. And as we move into the fall, there is an excitement growing and building that we can do great things together as God goes with us. And we want to constantly be giving you resources. Last thing is this. We want to constantly be giving you resources. The Valley of Vision, which you read today, we want to, uh, it was written a long time ago, but it's really good even for today. It talks about the greatness of God, the gravity of sin, the hope for eternity. And uh, if you would like, we, we want to offer just five, five uh Five days in a row, we're gonna, we want to send you a copy of one of those, uh, one of those uh, prayers. In fact, if you go to crosspointchurch.com slash valley, we'll just send you one every day, and it'll be a five-day journey. Would you, would you just take that five-day journey with us and use that in your quiet time? Use that to simply pray and uh, give God uh, the, the glory in the midst of your walk together. And listen, we're going to sing in just a moment. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. We're going to stand to our feet and we're going to sing this song, Jesus Paid It All. What a glorious song. What a glorious opportunity. So would you pray with me? And then we're going to stand to our feet and we're going to sing as loud as we can. Why? Because we know that Jesus paid it all. Lord Jesus, right now, would you have your way with us? Would you allow us to recognize that you have paid it all? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. My sin. And stay, he washed it white as snow. Oh, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leopard spot.
on, let's just give him praise. He is so worthy. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made. You are so good to us. You are so faithful every time. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. All right, Cross Point, thank you guys so much for joining us, whether you're online or whether you're here. It was just such an honor to get to worship with you guys this morning. Be blessed this week. You are sent. <laughs>